Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Um, folks, do let me know if the sound is fine. Just quickly testing it. Um, I do apologize for getting here so late. Um, I was here on time, but there was an issue with the uh, uh, connection or something. I don't know. I restarted the laptop and alhamdulillah, here we are. Um, so today, of course, the topic is... Um, before anything, alhamdulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. First of all, I'd like to, after thanking Allah, the most merciful for allowing me to share the little knowledge that I have on this topic, I'd like to thank the organizers of this AIM conference, Sheikh Karim, Sheikh Uthman. It was nice to see Sheikh Wasim. I wish I was there to be with you guys. Um, and I appreciate, of course, being given this opportunity. Um, first of all, folks, um, I would just like to point out that this topic, the journey of the soul, and uh, it, it's a very hard topic to, topic to talk about because of how little we know on, about the subject. And we do have an idea about some of the aspects of this journey um, and some matters that pertain to it. Um, one very important verse in the Quran, they ask you about the soul, say the soul is from the command of my Lord, and that knowledge that you have been brought is but a little. Yeah, so the Quran does not give us too much information about the nature of the soul in regards to the revelation of the verse. Um, we do have an authentic hadith by Ibn Mas'ud that kind of gives us some sort of a context of what's going on. He says, um, while I was walking with Allah's Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in one of the fields of Medina, and he was walking, leaning on a stick, he passed by a group of Jews, or excuse me, um, yeah, he passed a group of Jews. Um, some of them said to the others, ask him, meaning the Prophet, peace be upon him, about the soul. Others said, don't ask him. But they asked him regardless, and he stood leaning on the stick, and I was standing behind him, meaning a bit misrood. And I thought that he was being divinely inspired. So Ibn Mas'ud notices some signs um, in which like the Prophet, peace be upon him, displayed uh, in his demeanor some physical uh, matters that allowed him to realize that the Prophet, peace be upon him, was receiving revelation. Um, it, it could have been like something like uh, profusely sweating or something along those lines. Um, some signs that we find in, in other hadiths. In any case, he, he of course, while he's leaning on a stick, right? So Ibn Masud says, I was standing behind him and I thought that he was being divinely inspired. And then he said, they ask you concerning the soul. Say, they ask you about the soul. The soul is from the command of my Lord and that little knowledge that you have been brought is but a little. Now, on that, some of the Jews said to the others, didn't we tell you not to ask? Ibn, Abba, Ibn Abbas adds a little more to this report, and we find this in Sunan Tirmidhi. Um, it's authenticated by Tirmidhi as well. He says that they replied to the Prophet, peace be upon him, we have been given immense knowledge. We were given the Torah, and whoever has been given the Torah, then he has indeed been given a wealth of knowledge. So the following was revealed. If the sea were ink for the words of my Lord, surely the sea would be exhausted, meaning before the words of my Lord would be finished. So the Jews at the time, excuse me, not even at the time, um, centuries before that, they had this motif. It traces back to a rabbi called Rabbi Elizar. He, he used to say, for if all the uh, oceans were ink, all the reeds were quills, all the men scribes, they could not write down what I learned in scripture and repeated in Mishnah tradition. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like ironically responds, if the sea were ink for the words of my Lord, surely the sea would be exhausted before the words of my Lord would be finished. And in another, in another verse, if all the trees on earth were pens and the oceans were ink refilled by seven other oceans, the words of Allah would not be exhausted. Surely Allah is almighty, all wise. So we find the Quran engaging with the, Jewish, with the Jewish motifs, mirroring them, challenging the knowledge of the Jews. And of course, then we have back in the earlier narration by Ibn Mas'ud, 
we find them saying, didn't we tell you not to ask? Seems like they knew what was going on. They understood that the Quran was challenging them in that way. In any case, um, we do, uh, back to the topic of the soul, there's one thing that I find like really interesting about the whole topic in general, because like you have different philosophies arriving to ideas about our existence and the existence of the soul. Like, for example, look, you know, think about reincarnation. I mean, I could be mistaken, but it seems like the idea of reincarnation um, came from this, this idea that has to do with our own consciousness. So like we pass away um, and our consciousness fades, but does that mean that like we cease to exist? Because we've been in that situation before, right? Um, we, we did not seem to be anywhere and then we became somewhere. So similarly, it seems like this is their thought process. And, and that seems to have been what led them to this idea of reincarnation. Of course, there, there are major issues with the idea because like they're looking around and they find consciousness in different beings, in animals, right? So this idea of karma um, then being put into the equation, you know, if you're bad, you get reincarnated into a dog or into a pig, vice versa. Um, and I mean, the whole thing sounds ridiculous, but there, there is this question that ties to everything, which is how do souls even enter the bodies in the first place? Like what causes, what causes the goodness of a soul to enter into a human or the badness of a soul to enter into a mouse? Are souls like randomly floating around? And like Islam, alhamdulillah, has answers to that. And it seems like these philosophies, they just try, try to come up with anything in order to answer like these questions of life, which is like a natural tendency. Um, now with Islam, alhamdulillah, again, we have like clear answers to some of these things. We find these clear answers in the Quran and the Sunnah. Um, and these answers, they are sufficient for our journey and they aid us in our journey in this dunya because they give us an idea of what's to come. Of course, there are some other topics that have to do with the soul that are just like things that are like open to speculation. Um, and personally, I'm not someone who really enjoys too much speculation, but we do find, we, we do have a, a rich culture of speculation, I guess. Um, but let's start at the very beginning. This may sound like a, a little obvious, but the soul is something that's created. So the soul does have a beginning and I'm not like only talking about bodies, but I'm talking about the soul itself. Yeah, that's the first thing. Uh, the souls did not exist eternally. Um, now where things get a bit complicated is this question of what, com what comes first or what came first, the soul or the body? Um, I wish I could see you guys because it's a question I would love to uh, pose to the audience, but you know, um, I don't know if that's possible. Um, organizers, is that something that we can do? Okay, maybe not. But yeah, so so I'm. Uh, I mean, personally, um, I had I didn't have too much of an idea about this. My my assumption was simply, hey, maybe it is uh, just like the the soul was there earlier. But then when you look into it, you find um, a clear disagreement among classical scholars um, on this subject. Um, so, firstly. Um, you have this, the early, the, the position that's held by most scholars is the position from Hamid bin Nasr al-Marwazi, as well as Ibn Hazm. Um, and they hold the view that, uh, the soul came first and then the body. Um, and this actually seems to be the more popular view, seems to be the view of the majority. Wallahu um, on the other hand, you have some like major scholars that had the other view, like Ibn Qayyim, and it seems like Ibn Kathir also believed that um, the body was created first and then the soul. And uh, it's strange because like there are actually like a, a good number of um, arguments that support both positions. So in Surah Al-A'raf, uh, verse number 172, um, prophet when you, or prophet between brackets, when your Lord took out the offspring from the loins of the children of Adam, and made them bear witness about themselves. He said, am I not your Lord? And they replied, yes, we bear witness. So you cannot say on the day of resurrection, we were not aware of this. 
طيب. So this um, in itself, this specific verse, seems to suggest that souls have been there before the bodies, before our uh, specific individual bodies. However, like if you, uh, you do actually find some scholars that say, um, that no, if you actually read this without any um, context or without any background, um, and, and we're assuming that there is no context, if you just like read the verses for what they are, you can come to the conclusion that um, that this interpretation is not necessary. So, for example, um, the verse says, when your Lord took out the offspring from the loins of the children of Adam and made them bear witness about themselves. This could have been like to you and to me now, right? Um, and this could be referring to our birth. It doesn't have to be referring to like a, a plane in the earlier existence where all man was there and they were taken from the backs of uh, Adam, alayhi salam. So that's my understanding. Um, so Ibn Anbari says this is like a valid interpretation to uh, this specific verse. But and then we have some other hadith that seem to be a bit more clear that actually do speak about being on a separate plane of existence. So Abu Huraira says that the messenger, uh, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, said that when, Ad, when Allah created Adam, he wiped his back and every person that he created among his offspring until the day of resurrection fell out of his back. He placed a ray of light between the eyes of every person. Then he showed them to Adam and he said, O oh Lord, who are these people? He said, these are your offspring. Yeah. So, I mean, this one seems quite explicit that the soul has been there before the body. Now, Ibn Qayyim has uh, an interesting uh, explanation for this. He says, as for the hadith of Abu Saleh from Abu Huraira, by the way, hadith is an intermedi um, for those that are interested. But Ibn Qayyim says, as for the hadith of Abu Saleh from Abu Huraira, it only proves the extraction of the offspring and their appearance in the image of specks, some of which would be brightened and others would be darkened. And it says nothing about whether the exalted Allah created souls before bodies or that he had them bear witness at one place, or that he sent each soul when the bodies were created. Yes, he, the exalted, specifies each body to a soul that it was destined at a time, at that time. But as for him creating the soul for that body at that time, or that he created it and placed it, uh, and, and placed in somewhere separate from the body, and then sent it to the bodies from that place, then there is nothing in the report that suggests this if you look closely. So the statement, um, you know, it's, it's an interesting uh, idea by Bukayim, but it, again, it does conflict with the classical understanding of like major classical scholars. Um, it's Haq bin Rahawi, um, who many of you will be familiar with as the teacher of Bukhari, um, the author of uh, Musnad is Haq bin Rahawi, states that there's a consensus among the people of knowledge that the souls were created earlier than the bodies. And he like specifically attributes this hadith to uh, Abu Huraira. I'm assuming, Wallahu alam, he, he's attributing it to Abu Huraira because um, Abu Huraira is narrating the previous hadith. So now the opposing view, you have Ibn Qayyim himself using, for example, Surah Sa'd uh, verses number 71, 72, and he's arguing, of course, that the body was created before the soul. Um, and he quotes, so mention between brackets, when your Lord said to the angels, indeed, I am going to create a human being from clay. So when I have proportioned him and breathed into him of my, between brackets, created soul, then fall down to him in prostration. And then um, you have Ibn Qayyim providing commentary from Ibn Abbas, Ibn Mas'ud, that provide like a greater context for this report. Now, I, I will admit that, um, it, you know, this does seem like convincing, right? But there is like one um, matter that kind of could be used to respond to this. And one could say that this is like specifically for Adam and that uh, for the rest of humanity, it's very possible that our souls were created before um, our bodies. So, Wallahu alam. 
Um, another argument that's brought forward by Ibn Qayyim is in narration you find in Sahih Bukhari and Sahih Muslim from the hadith of Ibn Mas'ud. He says, um, Messenger of the uh, Messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Messenger of Allah, uh, peace be upon him, the truthful and receiver of the truth, informed us, saying, The creation of you, meaning the humans, is gathered in the form of semen in the womb of your mother for 40 days. Then it becomes a clinging thing and similar. Then it becomes a lump of flesh like that. Then Allah sends an angel who breathes the soul into it. The angel is commanded to record four things about it. Its, provi its provision, its term of life, its conduct, and whether it would be happy or miserable. Of course, the key part here is that Allah sends an angel who breathes the soul into it. Now, Ibn Qayyim comments, the angel alone is sent to blow in the soul. And when he blows that, uh, when he blows it uh, into, when he blows the soul into the body, uh, it starts to exist within him. And the report doesn't say that the angel brings the soul to him. Like, he's not coming with the soul and places it within the body. But the angel is sent alone. So, and so on and so forth. Now, personally, when I'm looking at the report, um, I, I can see how it's understood both ways. Um, again, like I would look at this initially and I would say maybe this is referring to the soul um, being with the angel um, because it doesn't say, there's nothing in the hadith that says that the angel um, made the soul exist or ha created the soul or Allah subhanahu wa created the soul at that specific point. So, wallahu alam, I guess it can be viewed in both ways depending on how you look at it. In any case, um, whichever it is, the specific hadith provides us with information as to how the soul is initially connected to the body. And to me, I, I believe that's perhaps the most important point. A soul doesn't wander into a body accidentally. A specific soul is connected to a specific body intentionally by an angel. It continues to have a connection to the body until death. However, every time someone goes to sleep, the soul leaves the body while remaining somewhat connected to it. We find in Surah Zumar, verse number 42, Allah takes verse number 42, Allah takes the souls at the time of their death and those that do not die during their sleep. Then he keeps those for which he has decreed death and releases the others for a specified term. Indeed, in that are signs for a people who give thought. We find Sahih Bukhari, the following narration from Abu Qatada, in which the Prophet, peace be upon him, commented. When he and the Sahaba overslept, he said, "Allah captured your souls, and when He willed, uh, when He willed, uh, Allah captured your soul. Uh, Allah captured your souls when He willed, and returned them when He willed." So I don't know about you guys, by the way, but like me personally, when I um, sometimes get a good night of sleep, sometimes not even when it's a good night of sleep, just any sleep, um, I wake up like feeling this clarity and feeling that feeling my immortality. It really feels like my soul was disconnected from my body. I don't know about you guys, but something I, I personally feel. It's very strange. I, I can't really put it into more words than that. But like the, the idea of death is extremely clear to me um, when I immediately wake up. So in any case, um, the soul's connection to the body is one that is there up until the moment of death. And what is death specifically? Ibn Qayyim says the correct position or opinion in regards to death is Death is the separation from the soul, from the body. And, you know, this idea of death equating to nothingness, uh, no, that's not the case. That's not the proper definition. Um, as to what occurs at death, we have a lengthy hadith by Bara that provides us with a lot of info, with a lot of details in regards to what happens at death. Al Bara bin Azib said, We went out with the Prophet to the funeral of a man of the Ansar and came to the grave. It had not yet been dug. So God's messenger sat down and we sat down around him quietly. He had in his hand a stick in which he was making marks on the ground. Then he raised his head and said, Seek refuge in God from the punishment of the grave, saying it twice or thrice. He then said, When a believer is about to leave the world and go forward to the next world, angels with faces white as the sun come down to him from heaven. One uh, with one of the shrouds of paradise and some of the perfume of paradise, and sit away from him as far as the eye can see. Then the angel of death comes and sits at his head and says, Good soul, come out to forgiveness and acceptance from God. It then comes out as a drop flows from a water skin, and he seizes it. And when he does so, 
they do not leave it in his hand for an instant, but take it and place it in that shroud and, and that perfume. And from it there comes forth a fragrance like that of the sweetest musk found on the face of the earth. They then take it up and do not bring it past the company of, and, and do not bring it past the company of angels without their asking, who is this good soul? To which they reply, so on so and so, the son of so and so. So uh, using the best of his names by which people called him on the earth. They then bring him to the lowest heaven and ask the gate should be open for him. This is done. And from every heaven, it's our angels. Uh, escort him to the next heaven till he is brought to the seventh heaven and god who is great and glorious said says record the book of my servant in aliyin aliyin is of course is the highest level or off the highest levels and take him back to the earth for i created mankind from it i shall return them to it and from it i shall bring them forth another time his soul is then restored to his body Two angels come to him and making him sit up, uh, say to him, who is your Lord? He replies, my Lord is God or my Lord is Allah. What is your religion? He replies, my religion is Islam. They ask him, who is this man who was sent among you? He says, he is God's messenger. They ask, what is your source of knowledge? He replies, I have read Allah's book. I believed in it and declared it to be true. Then one cries from heaven. My servant has spoken the truth, so spread out carpets from paradise for him, clothe him from paradise, and open the gates for him to paradise, into paradise. Then some of its joys and some of its joy and fragrance comes to him, and his grave is made spacious for him, as far as the eye can see. And a man with a beautiful face, beautiful garments, and a sweet odor comes to him and says, Rejoice in what pleases you, for this uh, for this is your day which you have been promised. He asks, who are you? For your face is perfectly beautiful and brings good. He replies, I am your good deeds. He then says, meaning the person in the grave, my Lord, bring the last hour, my Lord, bring the last hour so that I may return to my people and my property. So that's, by the way, that's half of the hadith. The other half refers to the kafir and of course, um, you know, how how things uh, do not work out for him. Uh, but just for the sake of brevity, um, I will allow you guys to return to that. The hadith can be found in many, many sources, um, including Musa uh, Ahmed, Sunnah Abi Dawood, and Nasa'i, authenticated by Abu Awan and his Mustakhraj and other sources as well. So in this hadith, we are told of the separation of the soul from the body initially and it being taken into heaven. Then it is returned to the body to be questioned again by the angels. Then we so we get this idea of um, how things occur. But now we have this other aspect to um, the journey, which is what happens until then. What happens until the day of judgment? Um, is the person there in the grave until the day of judgment, or is the person uh, there just like temporarily and then they're going somewhere else um, in this other world? So. Unfortunately, there's a difference of opinion among scholars in regards to that as well. Um, and one position uh, is that the person stays at their grave until the day of judgment. This is the position of Ibn Abdul Bar, and um, he refers to multiple hadiths that speak of the deceased being told by angels showing the deceased his position in heaven or hell. And then he's told, This is your place until the day of judgment. Now, however, it seems like. Um, most scholars, it seems like they didn't hold to this view. Uh, Ibn Qayyim responds by explaining that the following uh, about the nature of the soul. He says, we have made it clear that the deceased being shown his seat in heaven or hell does not prove that the soul is in the grave at all times. Rather, it only shows that there is a connection to the grave, which is limited to the times in which he is shown his seat. The soul has another affair in which it is with the most high. In the highest of places while being connected to the grave and now if someone comes to offer their salutation the soul is returned to the grave for him to return for uh, to, for him to, the, to, to return the salutations now despite that person being with the angels and this is a mistake that many have fell into since 
uh, they also they think that the soul is like the bodies in the sense that it's contained to a specific place and it cannot be in another. Um, then Ibn Qayyim like provides examples. He, he explains that the Prophet peace be upon him saw Musa alayhi salam uh, praying in his grave, and then he saw him like being in the sixth heaven, which indicates that the soul travels at imaginable speeds. Um, according to another hadith that we can find in Sahih Muslim, um, they are uh, they are literally I mean the souls they are in heaven after they pass away, and the hadith cited says this. Um, it's now written on the authority of Masruq that we ask Abdullah, meaning Abdullah bin Mas'ud, about the Quranic verse, think not of those who are slain in Allah's way as dead. Nay, they are alive, finding their sustenance in the presence of their Lord. He said, we ask the meaning of the verse from the Prophet, peace be upon him, who said, the souls of the martyrs live in the bodies of green birds who have their nests and chandeliers hung from the throne of the Almighty. They eat the fruits of paradise from wherever they like and then nestle in these chandeliers once their Lord cast a glance at them and said, do you want anything? Do you want anything? They said, what more shall we desire? We eat the fruit of paradise from wherever we like. By the way, notice how um, the souls, they're in birds, they're speaking, um, they're moving freely, well, to a degree, in heaven, um, and and like they, they have like uh, consciousness um they seem to have memories um so like they're very alive in that sense and of course the verse says that itself that they are alive with their lord right so there are some circumstances brought um towards this excuse me uh, there are some criticisms brought towards uh this position um and of course Ibn Qayyim is, is quoting this as uh, evidence that people will not be stuck to their graves. But yeah, the first criticism is that this report is specifically saying that this is referring to martyrs. Um, so what about the rest of people? Maybe like the rest of people are stuck to their graves. Um, now, there is a response to this, which is that um, the narrations of uh, Ka'b bin Malik, which you also find in the multiple classical sources, um, seem to suggest that it's not only referring to martyrs, but it's referring to all believers. However, unfortunately, there's a, a lengthy back and forth between classical scholars on this. Um, at least Muhammad bin Yahya al-Dhuhli has a lot to say about this report. Um, and wallahu alam in regards to its authenticity, because uh, there are some paths that's, that would suggest that the hadith is disconnected. So wallahu alam, it's really hard to say whether people being, um, believers being within birds, is that something specific to martyrs or is it something general to all Muslims, to all believers? Um, wallahu alam, wallahu alam. Another critique that is brought forward is that the report is suggesting that um, these birds will be in heaven or in paradise. Uh, but that's strange because you're so, you're only supposed to enter paradise in the afterlife, right? But I mean, there is a response to this, which is like they're not really fully within paradise itself. They're not like bodies, or they're not in their own bodies and uh, fully enjoying um, paradise and entering paradise uh, officially, let's say. But they're only benefiting from some of what is within paradise. So uh, Ibn Qayyim's uh, final verdict on the matter is that he argues that souls are in different places in the afterlife. Some are in the highest places um, with the prophets. Some are in the the uh, some are within birds that are floating across heaven, um, and some are right outside paradise. Um, and of course, some of them are like stuck to their graves, and some of them are stuck to fires within their graves, and that they will be tortured. And the Qayyim says like. Um, you have different op different opinions because you have different reports about this specific matter, um, which would imply that there are different levels. Wallahu uh, a'lam. Personally, like uh, it seems like some of these reports are weak, uh, and like Ibn, Ibn Abi Bar's position does seem to have strength. Uh, I'm not saying that Ibn, Ibn Qayyim's position doesn't have any strength, but yeah, like uh, it really seems like both positions are quite valid. Um, now. Ibn Qayyim um, 
I'm, I'm almost going to I'm, I'm going to be wrapping up soon, inshallah. Uh, Ibn Qayyim mentions that uh, the souls go through four different stages. Uh, the first is one in which things are quite compact. Um, life is really tight because one is uh, the soul is in the womb, right? Um, and that's the most compact uh, nature that it goes through. The second is the dunya, which is, of course, quite wide, as we are aware. Um, and then thirdly is life after death in this barzakh, um, which is the afterlife before the actual day of judgment. And that's much wider than this life. And then finally, of course, heaven or hell, which is the widest of all. And it is, of course, our final destination. And Allah knows best if this is uh, uh, yeah, correct. But yeah, wallahu alam. But now to conclude, um, unfortunately, uh, this topic, as important as it is, and as scary as it is, because you know, it has to do with the unseen, um, we do have some answers, and there is ambiguity in regards to some important aspects. However, in, in all cases, it is very beneficial, because the, the matters that are clear to us um, are matters that we can work towards. The, there are matters that we can be cautious about. Um, as for the matters that seem to be ambiguous or there's there are like differences of opinion in regards to, um, it keeps us on our toes. We prepare for the worst possible scenario. And of course, in both cases, there is much khair. Um, so yeah, in regards to what I've said correctly, um, that's definitely from Allah. And if I said anything that's false, then it's, of course, it's from me um, or from the shaitan. Uh, if you folks have any questions pertaining to the topic, I'll happily entertain those. But be warned, um, I'm pretty sure that for most of the questions, I'll probably be saying, I don't know. <laughs>